Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK, and I talk about different stuff every now and then, every now and then I have a roundup sometimes, like, like more recently I choose one topic that I want to discuss and share with you and share my opinions and my thoughts. Um, if you like what I talk about, you're welcome to subscribe and share and what else do you do? Like, subscribe, you can click the down arrow or yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, so basically I wanted to find out how comfortable you felt participating in this massive experiment, if it is a experiment, whether it's a hypothetical experiment, whether it's a real experiment, how prepared are you for it? And so I decided to write down some notes as I usually do, because that's what triggers me off. I, ha I normally have an idea throughout the day, and then I write down my notes, and then I refer to my notes when I'm doing my video, because that way I think to myself, yes, I can go off on a tangent, but at least I've got the main parts that I want to cover in what I've written down. So what might be the experiment? Well, to see how well the global population can be controlled by playing on their fears and insecurities. So how would they do this? Well, the government is working with behavioral, behavioral psychologists um, they've got a mind space program which can change views, values and behaviours and is a catalyst for ensuring people are susceptible to fear. That could be one of the goals. Because with behavioural um, psychologists, they actually um, study people's behaviour. They know what will make them afraid. They will know what will make them um, go into themselves, will make them insular, will make them panic, will make them anxious. They know exactly what to do. So in effect, we could potentially be puppets on a string. And depending on what they say to us or how they frame it in a certain way, it will trigger an emotion inside us. Depending on what the media say and how they say it, it will trigger another emotion and it's all designed to trigger various emotions i mean that's what advertising is all about it's got to do with psychology it's got to do with neuro-linguistic programming it's got to do with subliminal programming it's all to do with um what do they call it it's it's like manipulating behaviors manipulating reactions so in this hypothetical experiment, that is what is happening. We are all being programmed to become paranoid and to become fearful and to become insecure and to feel vulnerable. This is the experiment that you are involved in and are you prepared for? So like I've said, um, the government is working with behavioral psychologists. Um, they have a program, you can have a look at it online, it's called Mindspace. And they have another one called Behavioural Government. Um, the one that's called Behavioural Government, which can be downloaded um, via PDF, um, shows the government officials how to use behavioural, behaviour, behavioural science to improve government decisions. So can you imagine that when we think we're just going around our business and our behaviours are automatic, we're actually being programmed to react in a certain way. It's like when they put mice in a cage and they train it to do certain things. So in effect, that is what, that's what's happening to us. The majority of us are being programmed to behave in a certain way so we could be potentially controlled and they can work out exactly what to do. It's like playing a game of chess. If we, if we do this, how will they respond? If we do that, how they, will they respond? If we stretch them or push them a little bit um, this way, what will they do? How will they react? And so this is the experiment. This is a hypothetical experiment, by the way. 
Okay, so um, in one of my videos, I mentioned compliance, walking dead, lethargy, these traits or behaviours have been programmed. So the fact that the majority of people, especially in the UK, are lethargic, are compliant, are laid back, just couldn't be bothered. They're just like robots. They're quite happy eating, looking at their phones, looking at their videos or their films and um, their laptops or whatever they, whatever media or whatever platform they use. They're quite content and they've been programmed to be content. They've been programmed for convenience. They've been programmed to do exactly what the government wants them to do. And a lot of these people, they think they've got freedom of choice. They think, oh, I'm getting up in the morning and I think I'm going to look at my phone. I think I'll watch a film this afternoon. They think that they are making that choice, but they're not. It's all subliminal programming. So what else have I got here? Um, the majority of the population have been hypnotised through repetition, getting us to agree because of the way they frame and structure their briefings. And so people go along with government um, proposals without realising that is what they are doing. The government is using psychology to affect our behaviour. The government has a realistic view of human behaviour now, now, more now than they have had in the past. And they're using the pandemic to test it. Called it pandemic in this scenario. Okay, in essence, we are all part of an experiment or what you might call a simulation exercise. So if you think about it, you know, we, we, heard, we hear about the global deaths. It's constant global deaths, global deaths, global deaths. And now we talk about American deaths in America, deaths in the UK, deaths here, death there. Anyway, the total number of cases, not deaths, cases is 3,149,241. The number of deaths is 218,386. That's the number of deaths. And the number of recoveries is 962,000. 802, that's the recoveries. And what's interesting, they were able to um, they managed to get all the recovery figures of all of the countries except for the UK and the Dutch. Apparently, for those two countries only, they reckon recoveries is not a priority. Their priority is containing the virus. So they would prefer for us to hear constantly, constantly about death. They don't want us to hear about recovery. Because if we heard about recovery, we wouldn't be so fearful. We wouldn't be so compliant. We'd be thinking, wow, look at all those recoveries. If all those people recovered, you know, why are we worrying about dying? And the rate of recovery is much more. I mean, according to this, it's nearly four times more than the number of deaths. So they can't let us know about all those recoveries, because then we're not going to be so afraid, are we? If we think, OK, yeah, we can catch it, but we can probably recover from it, you won't, you won't worry about catching it. And what people forget is that our immune system is built to fight off viruses naturally. We don't even need any artificial interference to, to help us um, fight the virus. That's according to specialists, that's not according to me. Okay, um, so, um, so what you'll find is they're promoting cases as though they're deaths. Because when you hear about cases and you don't hear about recoveries, so supposing they said, oh, there's, like there is, 218, 200, sorry, 
3,149,241 cases. Now, if you didn't know about the recoveries, you would automatically think that all of those cases are likely to end up in death because that is how it's portrayed. But they don't all end up in death. And like it shows, the global number of deaths is only 280, it's still a lot, 218,386 deaths. So, but that is global all over the world, right? And then if you think about the recoveries being 962,802, you know, it's not such a bleak picture. But in this experiment, if, if you take away, you know, by omission, if you exclude a factor and you only give people, to, um, you know, if there's three factors and you only give people two, they're going to base their judgment on the two factors that you give them, i.e. the cases and the number of deaths, because the recovery is taken out of it. And with the recovery, it paints a whole different picture. A picture they don't want us to paint. So that is good news in that sense. So, um, and apparently, respiratory deaths were the same before the coronavirus as post coronavirus. So, um, it was 1,500, between 1,000 and 2,500 a week before the pandemic, apparently. And respiratory deaths post-coronavirus are alleged to be, well, they're said to be um, between 1,500 and 1,700. So there's no difference. The only difference is, is that the ones post-coronavirus are being labelled um, death through COVID-19. That's the only difference. And we have this comorbidity, which is not factored in, which is where they have underlying symptoms, and which could be, it could, you know, it could cause them um, to die from COVID-19, I mean, from the coronavirus, because their immune system is low. So, but it would be related, but they might not, they might not put the word related, they might do, but they're more likely to put coronavirus. So, um, so most deaths po post coronavirus pandemic have been labelled COVID-19, even if somebody died of cancer. Apparently, this family was, um, was really upset because on the birth certificate, on the death certificate, it had COVID-19 when he died of cancer. They couldn't understand why that was on there. And I think there's kind of, I think even though cancer is not a nice way to, death, to die, you want people, people's death to be labelled correctly. I mean, if I die of COVID-19, that's fine. I die of COVID-19. But if I die of cancer, I would like to think that they've got cancer on my certificate. I mean, who cares once you're dead, really? You don't really care, but apparently this family were really, really upset that COVID-19 was put as the cause of death and not cancer, and that's what he went into hospital for. So what else have we got here? So why don't the numbers add up? Well, according to Dr. Dan Erickson, he was giving this data for America. And he's been a physician in emergency for over 20 years. And he said, if you live in California, the chance of you dying of the coronavirus is 0.03%. And the chance of you recovering from it is 96%. He said, if you live in New York, which is considered a hot zone, the chances of you dying is 0.1%. And the chance of you recovering is 94%. And then he said, if you live in Spain, which is a hot zone in Europe, the chances of you dying from the coronavirus is 0.05%. And the recovery rate is 95%. 
So science and statistics are telling us one thing and the media is telling us something else. I think, I th you see, you can do a lot of things with statistics and you can do a lot of things through the news and you can you can take a portion out and you can make you can paint a whole different picture. And I think what the media does is that they report by omission or they insert something out of convenience to make, you know, because they're into sensationalizing. That's their job. You know, this they, they're having a field day now. Can you imagine they've had all of these, you know, all this boring reporting for all these months and now we've got the coronavirus. My God, they're looking for everything to kind of hype up the news and find something to report on. So it's not surprising that some of the details are not either current or they're not inclusive or there's a bit missed out. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me because they're not, sometimes they're not even privy to all the information. So sometimes they can't report accurately. So science and statistics are telling us one thing and the media is telling us something else. The coronavirus is contagious, but there have apparently been 18 strains of coronavirus before this one. And there was no vaccines ordered. So I don't know why in this particular round they've gone gung-ho with the lockdown They've got gung-ho with, you know, promoting testing and they want to go gung-ho with the vaccines. Why this particular round of coronavirus? Why not the other strains of the coronavirus? And when you think the flu comes around every, every year, same thing, you have your, your flu vaccine. So what is the difference? We not we don't have a lockdown for the flu, and I haven't got the figures for the flu, but I know it's almost the same as coronavirus. So why haven't they locked down the the whole half of the earth because of the flu? Why is it what is it about this particular experiment to do with the coronavirus? Why it's being treated differently? And, you know, my, one part of me um, thinks it's just about seeing where they are with who we are. Because, yes, they have an element of control, you know, over our, over our data. You know, we give them permission. You know, they, they ask us for information. You can't be bothered to say no. So every minute you're just saying, OK, OK, OK. So you're giving them permissions left, right and centre. So they got permissions um, to access our data, whether it's for advertising or whatever. So it's not about that. It's about moving the goalposts very, very slowly, I think, to see how much control they can have over us as individuals before we react. And it's like, you know, when you, it's like a testing phase, you know, like with animals, you, you, you test to see their limits. And I think this is a bit about what's going on. OK, so they locked us down for three weeks. Mm, they fared very pretty well. They've done pretty well. We've been congratulated even. We've been congratulated for our sacrifices. And so now, hmm, we haven't really got the response we want. No, because they're looking for a much more active response. So we haven't got the response we want. So let's move the goalpost a little bit. Let's kind of tip it a little bit more. Let's see what happens when we push it another three weeks. Yes, we're taking a risk with the economy, but let's see how they're going to react. If we push it another three weeks, because bound to people are bound to get start getting worried then, they're bound to not be able to hold their their um, jobs or their homes or whatever. Let's see what happens when they start losing their jobs and they start losing their homes. Let's see how these people will react. This is all hypothetical, okay? But I'm just saying, if this is an experiment, that could be one of the reasons to see how people react. And so they're pushing the boundaries, to see what the outcome will be so that they can see exactly what they can do from what they can't. Who's going to put up resistance? And what's interesting is that there's a lot of medical experts who are whistleblowing, who are, you know, giving information about 
the virus and about the numbers and all of this. So we're getting information we wouldn't otherwise have got. So that will all be a part of the experiment to see, OK, we want to find out who's going to be saying what. How are they going to say it? And then we, when, when if, if this is an experiment, if this is a, sim, um, a simulation exercise, then next time they'll know how to shut that down. Because these are the things that are causing the problems. These are the things that will stop it from going smoothly. And if nobody causes enough ruckus, they probably just go through with this pandemic or this experiment through through to the, its fruition. It all depends. It depends on individuals like you and me. How we react, how far we let them go, how far what how much we can tolerate what we can let them get away with. There's a barrister. Um, his name is Hall, H-O-U-L, Field Chambers. And he said that the, um, the health protection coronavirus um, regulations, whatever it is, England, he reckons it's actually an unlawful document. But I'll read that a bit later. So, I mean, we wouldn't know that it's unlawful. We're not lawyers, are we? When they're right, I mean, we know our freedoms are being infringed, but our freedoms are being infringed, infringed under the umbrella of our safety. How clever. And that's how they get us to come into agreement. They make it look like, okay, do you want, do you want to be safe? Yep. Is this important? Yep. And, you know, all you need is about three yeses and they need to do all this repetition stuff with this neuro-linguistic program and brain, brain, whatever they're doing to program us. And that's all they need. And people go along with like herd. You know, the herd mentality is created and everybody just follows nicely over the precipice. A few little strays that stay behind are a bit more aware. They can kill them off easy. There's only a few of those. The majority of them over the precipice. Lambs to the slaughter. So um, what else have I got here? Um, Dr. Erickson says there are millions of cases, but comparatively the numbers of deaths are small. And the difference between the other COVID, the difference between COVID-19, the one, this recent one, and the other viruses, is that the money and the hype um, is put behind this one to get the desired reaction. There was no money or no hype. They probably weren't ready yet. Because when you think about it, these, like they call it the pandemic, these things are done strategically. It's not just come out of the air. This is, this is well thought through. Do you think all of a sudden they said, oh, we've got a virus. Oh, that means we have to be locking down. Oh, you know, that means everybody has to stay in their house. Oh, let's have some legislation to stop people from leaving their house. Oh, let's stop this. Let's stop that. Do you think it all happened just like that? Do you think they just thought about it over a couple of days or a couple of weeks? No, they didn't. This has been going on for ages. This has been planned. In this experiment. So what else have we got? So what is the experiment? To see how fear controls and to what extent. To press buttons and test reactions. To track people via lockup or lockdown. Program and monitor behaviour. To see how the country will react to ultimate control. As outlined in the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions England Regulations 2020 which according to the barrister I was telling you about, Francis Hall of Field Court Chambers says is unlawful and is also to test the effects of putting healthy people in quarantine. Because quarantine is meant to be for the sick, you know, but by putting healthy people into quarantine, you're actually um, reducing their immunity. 
you're weakening the immune system. So what it looks like is that it looks like they want people to catch the coronavirus. To me, it looks like that's what they want. They want people to catch the coronavirus because if you lower their immune system or weaken their immune system, that's how the coronavirus jumps in and takes hold. So if you are locking people down so that they're stressed and depressed and, you know, and that and that lowers your immune system, of course, the coronavirus is going to jump in and take over. And by locking people up and, you know, taking their jobs away and, oh, yeah, albeit you're saying you're going to give them money, but look at the stress of trying to get the money and paying it on time. And, you know, and really and truly, if you really, if the government really wanted to help, as I've said in previous videos, they would stop mortgages and they would stop rents from being paid while this pandemic is going on. But they're, they're not doing that. It's almost like they're perpetuating the fear. They're, they're fueling it so that people become more stressed, more upset. Some people are dying of heart attacks. More heart attacks now than ever. Suicides, domestic abuse. What about that, that baby, three-year-old baby? And the, um, the few-month-old child that was stabbed to death. I mean, surely that has to be somebody who's gone over the edge. Health professionals will tell you that the human body has the best defense mechanism and that the human body is geared naturally to fight the virus unless the immune system is compromised through stress, fear and isolation. And what is lockdown doing? It's creating stress, it's creating fear, and it's creating isolation. So you're prime for the coronavirus. And through psychological programming that can control your perception of reality, you know, that causes anxiety. Fear weakens the immune system and the media is perpetuating fear through a hypnotic program of repetition and implied agreement. Yes, it's dangerous. Yes, I want to feel safe. Yes, this is important. And so you're going along with it because subcon subliminally you're being programmed. So neurolinguistic programming, which is known as NLP, uses nonverbal techniques to elicit the response it wants. It's a bit like sim subliminal programming, like they do in advertising. And like you see adverts appearing everywhere based on a, p a recent purchase. And it's like everywhere you look, you open up your phone, you open everywhere. COVID-19, stay home, stay safe, stay save the NHS, everywhere. Every little app on top of or anything you watch on YouTube, on top of all the news, anything you watch, it's in there everywhere. It's inserted all over the place. That is subliminal programming. That is deliberate so that you can't get away from it. You can't forget it. You can't stop it. So even if you say, okay, I'm not going to watch the news and you decide to go on your phone, you're still going to see it. It's everywhere. And I don't know how they managed to do it everywhere like that so quickly. So words in briefings are cleverly crafted to sound positive, to make it look like they have our interests at heart and are on our side when it's about placating the masses long enough to get everything that they're planning in place. And that's what it's about, keeping us sweet as much as possible, keeping us sweet because they've already got everything in place. They've got, why do you think they've got all the army in? Why do you think they've got all the old bill? Why do you think they've got, they've recruited thousands and thousands of police? So much so, they've got nothing to do that they need five or six police officers to break down the door of a little old lady. Somebody called the lady Mrs. Doubtfire. They had these sticks beating down her door and out come this little old lady. She looked like she was in her 50s in an apron and they're holding her up against a wall, five or six of them. And this is what the reason is. They've got too much police on standby. And they've got all the army just waiting for the 
for the for, for the instruction. And so this is what all this is about. They're trying to placate in this experiment. Remember, this is a hypothetical experiment to see who how they can tip, you know, how they can push the boundaries. And if they push the boundaries, and then they have this clause where um, if people, I forget the phrase, but it's more or less if people start retaliating, then they have the excuse to bring in the army. I mean, this really applies to America, but I'm sure it applies here as well, because we've got the army here as well, the military. So it could, it, it, it could mean all of that too. So they're just waiting on standby. Because, you know, for a few people just to say, listen, I've had enough. You know, let's get together. Let's, you know, we, we can't put this, put up with this. Because when people survive is at risk, that's when you see a different side of them. So, um, so how prepared are you for the mass, for this mass experiment? And how far are you prepared to go? At the moment, the experiment is resulting in a loss of jobs, loss of income, loss of stability, loss of um, homes and homelessness, increase in domestic violence, increase in child abuse, increase in alcoholism and drug abuse, increase in suicide, increase in depression, and a drop in education. And like I said, your body can fight off the virus, but they're trying to convince you that it can't. So, that's where we are now. So, what is your tipping point? What will, what will you do if lockdown continues, say, for another six months? What will you do if the government says there's no money to fund salaries anymore? They stop this... Um, 80% this furloughing, furloughing of employees. And like they say, they're thinking that they, they, they're not going to be able to continue to fund the NHS. What happens then? And then what happens when, you know, they stop all the, the, all the ports from bringing in food or whatever, and they decide that they want to control how the food is distributed. And so, and then there's the economic, economic collapse. Are you prepared for that? And then once all of that is in place and they decide, OK, now when you're at your most vulnerable, if you don't do A, B, C, D and E and you don't take this vaccination. Are you prepared for that? Have you thought about that? Like I said, this I'm just I'm just kind of um, creating a scenario some kind of experiment to see because sometimes I have to kind of think why is this happening what is this about are they really going to push it to the limit are they going to really destroy the country are they really going to push businesses so far that they can't get back on their feet because to be honest this coronavirus doesn't warrant the country being shut down and experts have said that it doesn't warrant it. So it's not about the coronavirus, it's about something else. And people have their views on what it's about. I'm not going to say what my views are. But how far do you think they are going to push this experiment? <clears throat> And how are you going to cope? A few tips. You can only buy so much after a while all the benefits just diminish. It's no point just buying and buying and buying. You don't know, number one, you don't know whether you're going to need it. You don't know how long. You've only got so long before the sell-by date. And, you know, you. I don't know if you've got space in your house. I mean, I've seen some of these Asian houses. And they've got these massive houses. And they've got stacks. Room full. And I'm thinking to myself, it always reminds me of... Um, was it Joseph, where everybody had to go to his house if they wanted something, so they'd travel miles and they'd, that's where they'd get their food from, this from this one person. And the brothers that um, took away his coat and made out like he was dead, left him for dead, had to go to his house and get some food when, it, when there was this famine. And I was thinking when I saw those... Um, 
those houses with stacks. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. That is not a family. That is a shop, a warehouse almost. And all I can think of is that when the time comes, they're the ones that are going to say, OK, you know, we've got this, we've got that. And they'll have their little shop in their house. So, like, well, I said that because what I'm saying is that you can only buy so much, depending on where you live, how much storage space you have, knowing what to buy and stuff like that. Um, you'll need to do your research, of course, and keep yourself periodically updated. You don't want to be watching the news every five minutes because it can be depressing. And that is where the programming comes in. And that's how you're programmed to become fearful. So you want to kind of limit it. You need to be updated because you need to know what's going on. But just watch it maybe once or twice a day, max. Once in the morning, once in the evening. The rest of it is mostly repetition anyway. Um what else and when you hear about new information just adjust your plans and adapt accordingly even though we don't know what's happening it is still good to plan um i'm not quite sure what you would plan because everybody's um, circumstances are different but you can kind of create some kind of plan just don't kind of expect that plan to take place or become effective but at least you've done something. But be prepared for changes. And the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. The only thing, you know, the only thing that um, actually will happen is that things are going to change and they're not going to go as you expect most of the time. So um, don't watch anything that will wear you down mentally. Stay on top of things that will affect you. Reduce stress. Stress is caused by your expectations how you think things should be and not the way they are. A lot of people, they they, they they rack their brain saying, oh, this shouldn't have happened. You know, why has this happened to me? And, you know, they go on and on. Oh, it wouldn't have happened if that hadn't happened. And that shouldn't have, you know what I mean? And they work themselves up in such a tizzy and create so much stress instead of just accepting where they are in the in the grand scheme of things and thinking, OK, yes, life is unfair or whatever, but this is where I am now and this is what I need to do. So um, make plans, but prepare to be disappointed because when you make plans and you expect those plans to take place, that's when you get stressed. So you can make a plan and think to yourself, OK, I'm making this plan, but I'm quite aware that things may not go the way I want them to go. Uh, <clears throat> adjust your plan based on new information. And remember, nervousness is natural. It's natural to be scared with what's going on because you just don't know what's happening. Life is unstable. So um, but still plan even though you're scared. Still plan even though it might not work out. Just plan anyway. And the solution is to strengthen your immune system. I mean, your immune system is what's going to get you through this. Get fresh air. I mean, if you don't have a garden and you, you don't think you've got a reasonable excuse to go outside your house, make sure you put your head out the window. Hopefully you've got a window in your house. I think every house has to have a window. So just put your head out the window and... and OK, eat as well as you can, but cut down on luxuries and try to be. You don't, it's a time to be a bit frugal. You don't know what's happening from next day to another. So, yes, it's nice to have food in your house. You don't know how long you're going to need it to last. So don't eat it all and stuff yourself. Be frugal with it. Only eat what's necessary. Every now and then I treat myself to an ice lolly. Sometimes I have to which is a bit naughty of me after I'm telling you to be frugal. But sometimes that's my little reward. <laughs> OK, so what else? Um, don't don't spend money on unnecessary stuff. You know, if it's not necessary, don't buy it. Um, budget. Um, see how much you actually need for essentials. And work from that. Most of the stuff is superfluous. You don't need everything, but just see what is essential. What can you do without? 
um, pay off what you can if you've got any credit cards, um, mostly credit cards if you've got credit cards or loans, while things are more or less, especially if you're working, if you're working at the moment, um, see what you can pay off because we do not know how long this work is going to last. Okay, even for those who are working. So pay off what you can while you can. Um, look for good deals and compare the market. You know, like for insurance, for anything. Um, just keep monitoring when your um, when your contract is up. I had a I had a letter yesterday to say that my my um, utilities, you know, my gas company, electricity company, it was now. Um, coming to an end and I had to change it um, by the 7th of May and I went on compare the market I went on confused.com and all of them and what I found was is that yes there was one where I could save 289 pounds a year but I didn't want a smart meter and they would they it was more even though it's not mandatory to have a smart meter they would say what I read from the reviews is that the only way you can get that saving, the 289, is by having a smart meter. So you have to kind of think, you know, yes, you might be saving, but there again, do I really want a smart meter? I don't really want a smart meter if I don't have to have one. I'm very good on the 21st of the month, I report my, um, my meter readings. So I don't want a smart meter, meter and I don't need one. So therefore, I decided to stay with who I'm with now. And I, um, but I did have a look at other ones. And yes, my one might be, I think, four pound more expensive. But I just thought for the headache and it's a reputable company and it had five stars. There was not one where I could pay 96 pounds, save 96 pounds, but it only had three stars. So you have when I'm why I'm saying this is that when you are comparing the market, you have to compare like for like and make sure the deal you're getting is exactly the same as what you're getting, but cheaper. And yeah, so that is that. And most importantly, unity, you know, need to stick together. We need to be speaking with one voice. Um, we need to be promoting what we want you know not what we don't want so we want you know we want our stability back we want we want honesty we want transparency we want to know what is going on we don't we i mean none of us are stupid <clears throat> but we want honest answers and you know we do have a few people who are speaking out but because it's not coming from the people at the top you can't do nothing with that information because you don't know how authentic it is. Even though they've got all the research and stuff like that, there's not much you can do with it until somebody who is very powerful takes hold of it and says, look, enough is enough. And that's what we need. And I'm hoping that that barrister, Hall, is going to um, persist so that that coronavirus act gets overturned because that would be a massive achievement well i've ranted on long enough i don't even know how long this video is but i hope i didn't bore you and that's all for now bye bye